Welcome to the Lowdown on Ghana Web TV. This program covers all the relevant issues from the hard truth to the facts and the fears. My name is Ni Akwe Ismail Akwe. Recently in West Africa, that's Guinea, there was a coup d'etat and Guineans were rallying behind the coup makers because they were relieved. If I would say all of them, well, that wouldn't be true. But some Guineans we saw in the media were happy about the coup and many Guineans are asking what's going to happen next to their country. And also looking at the issue in Guinea, so many experts have called on countries like Burkina Faso and even Ghana to tighten their security because anything like that could happen. There's also terrorism around the corner. Boko Haram is still active. Now we're going to discuss how the security threats in the region is affecting Ghana and the role Ghana can play in mitigating all these effects if they happen. Our guest is a security consultant and is an expert in the issue and he's going to talk to us about this right after this break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Lowdown. My name is Ni Akwe Ismail Akwe. And our guest today is Alhaji Ibad Ibrahim. He is a security analyst, consultant, and also a social commentator. Welcome, Ibad. Thank you so much for having me, Ni. Were you surprised when the coup d'etat in Guinea happened? No, the signs were quite clear. And for so long, we've come up with the idea that when you theorize how the 15 nations that make up the body of ECOWAS have transitioned uh, since the independence struggles in the mid-50s and then early 60s. You realize that the Francophone faction of the group has not been able to win itself of French subsistence. And so the coups we've seen in recent times have all been Francophone coups, Guinea-Bissau in Mali back to back, and now we have Guinea-Conakry. Even though there are, you know, various bags of challenges with the Anglophone bloc, um, the five Anglophone countries seem to be doing well. Uh, Ghana has transitioned a couple of times since the time of Rawlings. Uh, we've seen Olusogun Obasanjo uh, lead Nigeria from 99 and then transitioning to Omar Riyara Doha. He died in office, good luck Jonathan, then Buhari came into the picture in Liberia. And Johnson Sirleaf, you know, handed over power peacefully to George Weah in Sierra Leone. And then uh, the Gambia, even though with some checkered, you know, history mm -hmm. in the Gambia. So pretty much we need to, you know, look at the Francophone, you know, block. Uh, you know, when the French people left, you know, West Africa, uh, they gave two options to the nations who were becoming independent at that time. It's either it was a half-baked independence, mm -hmm where you would be tied to the umbilical courts of Paris and you would be on your own. So Guinea Conakry chose the latter. And we are told the French took away virtually everything, including desks in offices, and then they ripped off rail lines in some instances we were told. And so that was how come Kwame Nkrumah had to intervene. He gave $10 million to his brother, Sikuturi, who was the first post-independence you know, leader for Guinea. That's how come he has a son called after and yes. named after him. So with, with all these and interventions... So the French left a vacuum. Yeah. And these Francophone countries in West Africa have unfortunately not been able to fine-tune the role they need to play in a post-independent West Africa. So with the vacuum the French have left in Francophone Africa and also the setting up of all the regional bodies like ECOWAS, which is a mix of Francophone and Anglophone countries, wasn't there supposed to be a change? And what is the disconnect between the two? Sadly, with my background in diplomacy and having worked as a rapporteur, I know how some of these things work out. You could have a regional block do a meeting. It could be ECOWAS, ECAS for Central Africa, EGAD for Eastern Africa, and SADC for Southern Africa. Ni, then there is a resolution you need to make. A communique has to be issued. Then every now and then, representatives of certain countries would excuse you 
and then go make calls outside. So people need validation from France before they take certain decisions. And for me, that's pretty bad. Look at the choice of currencies, the safer. Mm -hmm. The safer is just an extension of the French currency. The reserves, the central bank reserves of these francophone countries are in France. So at what point can we come out clearly and say, you have to wake up and smell the coffee. If we, this regional bloc has to be truly independent, you need to sever your allegiance and ties to France in some instances. But sadly, we've not been able to get uh, the courage we need for some of these countries to come out against France. We'll talk more about the regional blocs, but with uh, the expectation or non-surprise of the coup in Guinea, could we say that it is, uh, I mean, is fair or is just to have the coup? And let's be, you know, fair to Alpha Conde. It's not like over the course of the 10 years he was leader, things went amiss completely. He was their president when Ebola struck 2014, 2015. We saw the leadership he showed. And Ghana's former president played a role. He worked hand in hand with him. We set up the Ebola Response Center uh, in Accra. Great job. He did his best in various you know, areas. He built two dams, one completely done. Many Guineans didn't have access to constant electricity before he came. And the other you know, and dam will be commissioned pretty soon. In terms of infrastructure, a lot more needs to be done in the country. So it wasn't like it was all gloom and doom from the one in office to the last day he was toppled. He did some good things. But where Alpha Conde went wrong mm -hmm. was when he made an attempt to, uh, you know, amend the constitution for a third term. And I see some hypocrisy on the side of ECOWAS. ECOWAS has pretty much become a firefighting regional bloc. When things are going wrong, they say, don't say anything. And that problem is inherent within the ECOWAS charter. Nee. There are protocols within the charter that dissuade poking your nose into the internal affairs of member states. Mm -hmm. So it's called the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of member states. So no matter how bad the decisions of a president are, you are supposed not to talk. You are supposed not to intervene. But when things go wrong, then they call on ECOWAS to intervene. Mm. So for me, that principle needs to be reviewed. You need not to be a magician to be told that there will be more coups in the sub-region. Because the things that Alpha Conde did to have warranted the coup are being done by other leaders. For a single of Togo, next door exactly. Togo, he has amended the constitution, he's doing a third term. Alassane Ouattara. And the Ivorian situation is an enigma, is an irony. Alassane Ouattara was a creation of breaking the jinx of longevity in power. Mm -hmm. The French deployed soldiers to topple Laurent Gbagbo. Then you come, you do your two terms, you've amended the constitution for a third term. And so I think the hands of ECOWAS are tied. You find people come up with a body of literature and research as ECOWAS outlived this usefulness. But if you don't arm ECOWAS with the tools to operate, then it becomes very difficult to preempt some of these things that have happened. So I wouldn't call the coup fair, but I think he has been a victim of circumstance. And Alpha Conde uh, would have a legacy of a mixed bag of good days and bad days. But unfortunately, he will be remembered as a toppled leader in West Africa. I know this uh, isn't, or we can't compare the West African regional bloc to the eastern, or I mean, uh, the ICAS that's in southern Africa, where we see Rwanda going into Equatorial Guinea uh, to help them with their issues there that they have, the rebels and all that. Do you think this is something that Kuwas could also add into their charter? Yes, you mentioned before we went on uh, on screen, uh, you mentioned the issue of the Gambia, and I'm happy your lovely reportage of the events of the Gambia mm -hmm. and the transitioning from, you know, uh, Yaya Jeme to Adam Baro. Baro. Yeah. ECOMOC was a precursor to the kind of intervention you are seeing in other parts of Africa. Uh, we saw the devastating civil war in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Mm -hmm. And so Nigeria took the lead. And whether we like it or not, Nigeria is the leader of the continent. Nigeria has the largest market. 
is the largest conglomeration of black people anywhere in the world, over 200 million people. Uh, so we need Nigeria to take the lead on some of these regional security issues. But Nigeria is contending with its own security issue in its backyard, mm. Boko Haram. Uh, so that leadership we saw during the time of Ekomog and the threat of the use of force in the Gambia uh, seems to be missing in currently. Uh, so we can pluck some pages from the playbook of Rwanda to be able to, we call it uh, African peer review. Mm. If you are Ghana, Nigeria should be able to say, okay, these are the steps we are taking economically, politically, socially, and you need to make these reviews. It is only when we strengthen the early warning mechanisms that we'll be able to forestall coups. It is said that coming events always cast their shadows. Mm. You need not to be told that these decisions being taken by this, this president will lead to this eventuality. And so I want a situation whereby there can be a sort of diplomatic intervention to be able to tell that, hey, inflation is too high in your country. Uh, things will bubble over. Mm -hmm. And so ECOWAS can come in. We have an ECOWAS parliament. We don't have an ECOWAS central bank. That is what differs African regional blocs from the EU. The European Union can actually give you a bailout. ECOWAS can't. So there should be a standby force for ECOWAS, a central bank for ECOWAS, so we can co control our forex, we can intervene economically to resolve some of these issues before they bubble over. Mm -hmm. And so going forward, I believe there are limits to what the diplomacy can do. Mm -hmm. And I believe that at some point, we need to use the bully pulpit of ECOWAS to resolve some of these issues before they spiral out of control. We'll soon talk about uh, the setup of the regional bodies and also uh, the hottest countries or the hotbed for security issues in West Africa and then Ghana's role in all of these issues that are popping up in the region right after this break. Welcome back to The Lowdown. My name is Ni Akwe Ismail Akwe, and we've been having uh, a discussion on security issues in the West African region with Alaji Ibad Ibrahim. So we're discussing how ECOWAS is limited in uh, dealing head-on yes. with some security issues that come up. We're also discussing the, the coup in Guinea. So yes. what are the limitations of diplomatic missions, diplomatic blocks like ECOWAS when it comes to such issues like the coup in Guinea, what is the extent they could go? The communicator has come out from the extraordinary session uh, summoned by the ECOWAS Chair of Heads of Governments, Ghana's own President Nanado, has done what we have done in recent years. As soon as there is a coup, the tools that are available within the toolkit are the things we use. First of all, we announce the suspension of the country uh, from ECOWAS. So the borders are shut. That's a semblance of uh, sanctions. But because we are not an economic powerhouse, you can say presidents or um, military people who have saved in banks within West Africa will have their accounts frozen. It is non-existent to begin with. Uh, so what you do is to come out and say that the membership of that country has been suspended. So that will cajole them uh, into putting together a transitional government. Uh, so from a mi military junta into a civilian government. Mm -hmm. But unlike in Mali, where Jerry Rawlings was involved, because Nanado, as chair of ECOWAS at that time, invited the military coup leaders to Accra. Mm -hmm. And they met Jerry Rawlings, because Jerry Rawlings has a history of transition from AFRC, PNDC, into a civilian government. So those were some pep talks. Mm -hmm that were instrumental in diplomatically resolving the Malian issue. But today, Jerry Rawlings is no more. We've lost him. And so what are, are the options? And again, I see intransigence on the part of the coup leaders because they are complaining when things were bad, where was ECOWAS? Why would ECOWAS now dictate to them what to do? And for me, it puts ECOWAS in a catch-22 situation 
because this is a situation you have to intervene. I'm told Ghana's foreign affairs minister is leading a delegation into the country. So they start talking. And so um, the military leaders uh, seem popular uh, currently. We saw the jubilation by a faction, even though you said that may not be representative yes. of the aspirations of all the people. So that means that if ECOWAS wants to use force to turn to a civilian government, there could be a civil war. Uh, so the options of ECOWAS are a bit limited. And I believe that when we Georgia, it's always better than war warring. Mm. Uh, so I believe that we need to speak to Colonel Mamandi and all the people involved in this school uh, to want to sit around the negotiating table with civilian you know, leaders, technocrats, who are ready to be part of a transitional government uh, so that we go beyond this. ECOWAS comes up with ad hoc measures. We saw in the Gambia, they involved Salif, Buhari, and other leaders. And immediately after the crisis, they dissolved that you know, initiative. Yeah. So it should be a continuous you know, standby initiative to resolve political and security issues. That is what is lacking. And so I believe the Equals Charter needs to undergo review. Uh, a charter that has been there for decades cannot serve the interests of a 24th and uh, 21st century sub-region. And uh, so where there needs to be more engagement, I think that is what we need to do. So that diplomatically, mm -hmm. the overarching impact of diplomacy can resolve some of these issues before they even up happen. There's an argument that the age factor plays a role in ECOWAS because uh, the leadership of ECOWAS, I mean, if you look at it avidly, none is... I mean, average age will be around 60. Mm -hmm. And most of these people have seen different regimes of the past. Mm -hmm. And there's been an evolution of how diplomacy is done. There's been an evolution of how states are run and all of these. But you can see that these people are looking at things from one direction. And there's an argument that when these or this age factor is dealt with, then we might have a different kind of approach to diplomacy in the region. All these ideas that are coming up and suggestions might be looked at and welcomed into the charter of ECOWAS and would have some continuity and growth. Is that also your uh, belief? That's a very good viewpoint. I hear a lot of clarion call on the part of the youth. Even in Ghana, we have fixed the country. In Nigeria, we saw NSAS mm. and what the youth wanted to do. They wanted to push the envelope further that beyond the dissolution of the Special Armed Robbery Response Squad, they wanted something else. But I always want us to tread on the side of caution. Because when the youth within the sub-region have been given the opportunity to assume positions of trust, they have in some cases been more corrupt than these aged, dying leaders we are saying they should leave the scene. Look at our universities whether NUCS or SRC, look at the allegations of corruption. So if somebody in your middle or late 20s cannot be trusted with the dues of students, how can we trust you with billions of dollars of uh, our GDP as a West African country? And uh, so I don't think it's a, an either or situation. And the youth and the aged can be mutually inclusive. We can tap into the wisdom of the aged and the exuberance of the young uh, to build West Africa and the rest of Africa. Uh, because the youth themselves have not proven themselves trustworthy uh, with their national pets, the national kitty, uh, in some cases. But aren't the you... aged to blame for this? Because if you look at the governments of all these leaders we're talking about, they're also old people. And the youth are put at the back to deal with young people. And the young people have they are the biggest numbers yes. of people in these countries. Yes. And you're also being corrupt. What do you expect them to learn? Or what are they supposed to learn from? Uh, they, they can always be different. Mm. And over the past three regimes, I think, in Ghana, we've seen very important and delicate positions handed over to young people. And what has been the jury out there, Ni? It's some, it's in, in some cases, it's been worse than having... Uh, a septuagenarian uh, occupy that position. And so for me, I think we should tread on the side of caution. And we can't blame the aging leaders too much. Why? You can't run for president until you are 40. And in some cases, some of them have had to struggle for 20 years or 25 or 30 years 
Nana do a nine a case intended to be president many decades ago and you only got the nod in 2016. So by the time you would have achieved your presidential ambition, you would be old. Uh, so maybe the system has to change. Isn't that a recipe for coup d'etat? Yes, yeah, it is, and I agree with you. So maybe we can bring down the age. If universal suffrage is 18, and currently we are even making an advocacy, that it should be lowered to 16. Because these, you know, uh, young people, they are able to do with uh, digital media what the agent cannot do. There are apps on phones now that teenagers in high schools know better than some people in the university. So these baby boomers, uh, people born in the 2000s, should be a part of the political system. So number one, we are making a recommendation that universal suffrage should move from 18 to 16. Because more exposure for these people at their age than we had in our time. And then why do you have to be 40 before you can run for president? We can lower that age as well to maybe 30 or 25 if you are an achiever uh, so that people will, we can shorten the curve. So by Obama ran as, you know, he did one term as a senator from Illinois. An opportunity presented itself. He became a president in his 40s. By Donald Trump and then Biden, Biden actually ran for president in the 80s. He didn't succeed in the primaries. And so it has taken this long for him to be there. And therefore, I think we would be comparing oranges and apples if we say that the aged, you know, generation have failed us. So let's wipe them off and then bring young people. I think it should be a melange or a mixture of the two so that West Africa and the rest of Africa will achieve the kind of goals we want. Now let's look at some security crisis in the region. We have Boko Haram. We have Fulani, Hesmen attacking people. We have uh, uh, even Islamic State, IS, in other countries. We also have COVID. We can't st rule out COVID. And we have so many others. They keep growing and they keep multiplying. Let's start with Boko Haram. Okay. Boko Haram. We, we are not seeing a regional push in fighting Boko Haram. Yes, we know the U.S. government is helping with intelligence, but they can't really go indirectly. I don't see Ghana playing any role unless maybe it's a security uh, strategy that they don't want to come out with that information, which maybe you might confirm or not. Mm. And uh, the entire ECOWAS mm. are looking on mm. and we are leaving Nigeria to their fate. Mm. Nigeria changed its head of military to fight Boko Haram. They had issues with that. A lot of soldiers were killed. Mm. Now they are changing strategies. How do you see Boko Haram ending anytime soon? You see, the region is responding to these security challenges, first to begin with Boko Haram. There are two classifications of security challenges. You have a conventional security challenge and you have an asymmetric one. Anytime it is conventional, like the war in Liberia and Sierra Leone, then you can come together and say, let's contribute soldiers, ECOMOG, then you go in, you exchange artillery, gunfire, and then you topple the bad guys and then make sure that there is a civilian government. But Boko Haram is an amorphous group. It adopts hit and run tactics. And so you can't tell the line of leadership. And even if you want to negotiate, who do you sit with? Yeah. And so it has become very difficult. So there's only one mission, peacekeeping mission within West Africa. It is MINUSMA. And that is to resolve the Azawad secessionist effort in northern Mali. Mm. So you find Timbuktu, Kidal, Gao, and Ghanaian soldiers are there. Yes. And they are there, you know, you know, contributing their quota to regional security. But we can't deploy to Nigeria. Uh, because Nigeria, number one, is a big brother. Uh, it will be a dent on the credibility, military credibility of Nigeria that you need soldiers from tiny countries like Ghana, to be able to fend off Boko Haram but it's attacks. okay for America to support? America supports materially mm. uh, with Intel because of the satellite assets they have within the region. Maybe trainers and all that. Uh, but Nigeria alone should be able to resolve the Boko Haram issue. Abuja is one of the areas I work with or in. And when I went to Abuja, I saw that, yes, um, the activities of Boko Haram have taken a toll on the 
foreign direct investment that would have on a normal day when you're going into a hotel the semblance of insecurity that is created all of that has really chipped away at the economic might of nigeria as a country but ghana can't deploy the way we have done in the case of minosma in mali uh, because this is unconventional uh, so we can help nigeria with you know morale we can help with diplomacy and all others but it will be and especially the FODA and the groups are feeding on they have made it a, a religious thing so if care is not taken they would want to transpose that kind of idea in individual member countries and mind you ECOWAS is largely made up of francophone countries and most francophone countries have a muslim population of not less than 85 percent and so if care is not taken and this idea of, you know, we are fighting against a system that is a Kafir system and it's going to pose a huge security. It would what, you know, spread into other regions. Already we've seen Cameroon suffer from the activities of Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. Even Chad, yeah. Idris Debi died fighting on the front lines, we are told. And so we've had to adopt a carrot and stick approach in tackling the Boko Haram menace. But on all other fronts, uh, the pandemic, we've seen, you know, coordination amongst nations. Mm -hmm. The time has come for us to strengthen the activities of West African Health Organization, WAHO. Uh, you know, there's WHO and there's yeah. WAHO. And we've, we don't hear too much about them. Uh, we need to see infectious disease centers uh, spring up everywhere. We need to see more collaboration, more exchange, uh, so that in future when there's a pandemic like this, we'll be able to be better prepared uh, to tackle it. But for Ghana, I would commend Ghana uh, because of our leadership role. Burkina Faso is the main security challenge now because Bles Kampore was toppled. The youth set the Burkina Bay parliament ablaze and there has been a vacuum. Uh, so Ghana is concerned that there could be a spillover. Mm -hmm. So His Excellency the President uh, was able to convince regional you know, countries to come up with what we call the Accra Initiative. That conference summit was held at Pedrasi Lodge. So nations have come together uh, to share intel. So Ghana, our neighboring countries, and Benin. So even if it is a pin, that falls. You need to share the intel with other nations so that you can protect you know, each member country from the activities of these groups. So if you asked me, I would say we are not doing too badly mm. in terms of confronting head on the security challenges militating against the stability of West Africa. But more needs to be done so that we keep the sub-region safe. Let's talk about Ghana's own internal security issues. And um, currently there's a call for the borders to be open. And the borders have been closed and there's a belief that it's affecting the, even the economy of the country. Is that something that you, 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 you believe in also? Do you think it should be opened? Um, off the cuff, I'll tell you that there are about 43 approved and unapproved entry points into Ghana. Mm. You see, when you are a sovereign country, there are th three entry points. You have your airspace yes. and you have your territorial waters. There's some um, 22 nautical miles before international waters. And then we have the borders, the terrestrial entry points. The most porous are the land borders. Mm -hmm. So when you go to Paga, Hamile, Sankansi, Elubo, Aflau, there are town folks who can put you on a motorbike and cross over to the other country. And they are doing that. And, they are, and you know, for them, the borders should remain shut because it's good business for smuggling. And customs people as well. There should be integrity in border controls. Some of the border areas, there is no surveillance. Mm. It's pretty much like just crossing over. And I believe it is important because some of these, you know, apart from smuggling, you look, look at the gun running that is going on. Look at the guns in civilian hands in Ghana alone. I sat with the former boss of the National Commission on Small Arms and Light Weapons some years ago, and their survey shows that at that time there were between 2.3 and 3 million guns in civilian hands. So that is, after, when you count every 10 Ghanaians, one of them has got a gun, and that is bad enough. How do these guns get in, even though there is some expertise for local manufacture? at Alavanyong, Konya, and also Swami Magazine in Kumasi and Abusuka in Accra, many of these guns cross over from the borders. Uh, so what are we doing as a country? Is it about paying 
uh, a little bribe so that you cross over with anything. And look at the um, sacks of onions that come from Niger. Look at the charcoal that comes from the, across the border. You see a huge truck and there are loads of sacks. And what kind of, you know, frisk and search do we do? Oh, you are from where? Oh, this is a Burkina Bay truck. Okay, 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 okay. Just pass. We need to have the devices that can, you know, filter through and tell that this contains narcotics, this contains guns. That expertise is not there. Uh, so I want to see us do more. You think it's we should not open just the about borders. opening the borders. Okay, but yes. we think we should open it but do more. Uh, we should open incrementally. Okay. Because Nigeria shut down its border with Benin mm -hmm. and people were so angry. Why would Nigeria, Nigeria do that? Because there were unintended consequences yeah. for Ghanaian traders, Beninois traders, Togolese traders. But they felt Nigerians should eat local rice. And Vietnamese and Filipino rice production companies were taking their rice through Benin and then crossing over through the porous borders. But Buhari stood its grounds. Eat your own food so that you would empower the local industry. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's not about looking inward or opening up entirely. I had a speech by one of the former presidents of Tanzania, Nyerere. Yeah, yeah. He said, oh, the white folks are deceiving us. They say there should be an open market. But when you put two boxes in a ring, you don't put a heavy weight with a light weight or a featherweight person. Uh, so why should our markets be dumping sites? Look at the fish we saw, the wheels we saw on Ghana's coast. When people researched and said, why did the wheels die? Some said they were distressed. They were stressed. That was why they died. Maybe somebody has dumped dirty oil in our territorial waters. And somebody has gotten paid for it. Mm. We know that British Petroleum and other giant corporations around the world come to our territorial waters and dump dirty oil. How can the fish in our seas survive? Uh, so it's not about just being an open market. There should be equity based upon the size of your market and what you are bringing onto the international market. And so we should have open borders, but we should do so in an incremental way to protect the local industry as well. Mm. So we will have to go on another break, but um, I was so interested in the open borders part because the moment to try to cut down on the infiltration of the market from or by the Western world, you might also affect other countries in the sub-region. Now we have a lot of countries, even in Ghana, where some of our products we import and then we repackage so that we would have it as made in Ghana, but it's actually not made in Ghana. Wow. Would they would also be affected if that is done? I think we need to work on the psyche of the black West African. Today, you travel and you come home, you give a pair of shoes to your in-law. If they see made in Italy, they appreciate it more than say this was bought from, you know, Tudu. It's locally made. Um, somebody has told me that even with the furniture industry, and I'm friends with the expatriate business people here, I can see a lot of, you know, Turkish people invest in that area. Look, the wood, wawa, mahogany, all the wood is here. But when the local manufacturers manufacture knee, for the mere fact that their showroom is not along the Spintex Road, you have to go to, into CMB to go and buy. Oh, this furniture is fake. I don't want it. So what they do now is, just as you have indicated, they take the wood across the border, repackage, and put made in France on it. And people are quick to buy. So we need to work on the psyche of the people within the sub-region to appreciate our own and patronize our own. Then the idea of an open border, an open market, that allows everything to filter through, will not affect. Look, we import everything, including toothpick. Mm. The toothpick, we import it, I'm told. Look at how you are dressed. Look at how this studio is nice, how I'm dressed. It is likely that 99% of the things here were not made here. And so it is important that we work on those. And the white folks don't like us. I don't, like, I don't believe in Moody's, the Bretton Woods institutions. They, they paint you black if you want to take charge of your economy. 
But when they give glowing tributes to your president, it means you are giving away too much. <laughs> and so I believe we need a rethink. And Paul Kagame has led the way uh, that we can look inward as Africans and still do well economically. This idea of open borders and open markets would only pander to the benefit of the Western powers. Thank you very much. We'll be coming back after the break to discuss, con we'll continue discussing our internal security. We have a new police IGP and uh, we have some new strategies the police uh, are adopting which is helping curb crime in the country. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to The Lowdown on Ghana Web TV. My name is Ni Akwe Ismail Akwe, and our guest is Alaji Irbad Ibrahim. So we're discussing uh, the security issues in Ghana, and we discussed the borders that are closed and how uh, some miscreants, let's call them that, mm -hmm. use the closed borders to infiltrate the country with some guns and other banned items. Now the police is busy, and they are very busy since the new IGP came on. And thanks to his uh, interest in publicity and the PR, we hear a lot about uh, police reactions and what they are doing. What do you make of the change in IGP? There are two ways police officers are trained in Ghana. We are involved at some point. The first one has to do with the state. Mm. So there are police recruitment, you recruit academies. You have Tessano, you have other areas of the yeah. country. So they go for training. But we believe that the conduct of policing in the 21st century cannot be based upon tools of the past. So we appreciate the kind of training they are given. But security evolves. So what we do is we retrain them on the job. So we have what we call intelligence and forensics training. So we have soldiers and I am happy to say I'm a facilitator in, in that program. Uh, so we teach them new techniques and all that, uh, suspicious packages management, uh, explosives and all that. So it's a partnership we have with the uh, security agencies and we are working in that regard. But there's a new sheriff in town and anytime there's a new guy, there's a lot of euphoria. I've even seen that we horses go on patrol in Ghana, yes. Uh, so the excitement is good, but sustainability is key. Dan Pari is an academic. He's one of only a few people with their PhD, with a PhD in the conduct of security in Ghana. And then he started humbly and he has got into that pinnacle. Uh, so I believe that he's going to combine theory with pragmatism to be able to resolve. But the fact that you have a new guy at the police headquarters doesn't mean the criminals will go to sleep. Mm -hmm. They will always test the pulse of the new mechanisms and strategies that are put in place. And so we still hear cases of armed robbery. I am concerned about highway robbery. An international journalist came here recently to um, conduct research into our security. And he ended up dying out of insecurity in Ghana. So you can imagine the kind of reviews we will get internationally. Yeah. I'm not happy with the way the barriers and checkpoints are predictable. When you travel between cities, you know that, oh, if it is from Accra to Kumas, when I get to Lindado, Forest Free Commission is there, the Ghana Police Service is there. When I get close to Konongo, uh, Asankari Barrier is there. These checkpoints should be snap checkpoints. They should just pop up like mushroom. Mm. So they become unpredictable because you can take like five kilometers knowing so well that within this, you know, these five kilometers, I will not meet any police checkpoint. And that is where the boys strike. And then there's the, the, these checkpoints are thinly spread as we even go to the north. And so the, these are unguarded, barren, ungoverned lands. And they're able to strike with reckless abandon. Prominent people are killed and they get robbed of their possessions. So I want to see the IGP work in that, do more in that regard. And the telcos, there are places where like Dadeso, when you get to Dadeso, you, you lose, you know, your connection to any, you know, mobile telephony. 
And that is where they strike. And our response time too is very bad. When you call the police, how can people be under distress? They call you, they are around Jolo, or they are around East Legon. Before you get there, your siren is blaring. You are giving the armed robbers a signal that you are on your way coming. So they should finish up the operation and leave. I believe that we need to change the strategy. And I want to see more plain clothes people. We should plant molds within these syndicates to be able, as I'm speaking to you, maybe in the coming hours, you'll get to know the work that has been done. Medical insecurity, mm. public health safety is a major national security issue. As we speak right now, I'm in, in talks with a team that will carry out a sting operation today. What is happening? People are smuggling, as we indicated, fake drugs with no authorization from the Ghana Standards Authority or the FDA. They are selling these drugs to people. Chief among them are aphrodisiac drugs. Mm. And you see people die of, you know, heart failure, kidney problems. So it's as a result of the consumption of these drugs. What is national state security doing about it? What we have impounded in two operations, according to the medical doctor working on this, run into the tune of a hundred thousand Ghana cities. So who monitors these people who are working on foot? How do you walk on foot to people at a base or in their offices and say, Oga, buy this one, it, it will make you stronger in bed. You should be arrested. The one patronizing it himself should be arrested. And so for me, security is a behemoth thing. It's not a gun and bullet thing. We can't limit it to that. Your health and safety, your well-being, the safety of your children when they go out to school, all of these come together to make up the body of security. And I think the IGP has a lot of work on his hands. Oof. There is goodwill. Yeah. There is public goodwill. Mm -hmm. I see footage of him taking part in night patrols. There is public goodwill. Mm -hmm. And the PR is top-notch. But beyond that, what are we doing to make the Ghanaians safer? You've shared views that I would say are collective sentiments of Ghanaians and we all go through these, like the checkpoints we're talking about, where police uh, who are supposed to be on patrols end up checking for, uh, uh, the, uh, how do you call it, the DVLA? Uh, Roadworthy. Roadworthy. And then they will check your shoes to see if you're wearing slippers or not. And then the criminals just use that to go and we see okay. them going ar around and doing their things. Also, the medical issues you've talked about. Is this a leadership problem? Is it a problem of capacity? Is it a problem of training? What is that, exactly do you think the problem is? It's a problem of perception. Mm. And I know Ghana Web is an international media outlet. Look at the unwholesome content media houses, you know, feed people. Mm. Because, you know... Somebody cannot just put together a concoction, but because a person can pay for airtime, you start playing jingles for the person. A casual look at the ads on TV would show you that a chunk of ad money comes from, you know, these drug sellers, medicine sellers, like Theop, um, they say they are herbalists, they are this, they are that. And how can one drug in Trotro solve all medical issues in the world? This solves cocoa, it solves headache, it solves TB, it solves this, it solves that. The guy should be arrested. So we need the well to be able to tackle some of this. Because you are waiting for Boko Haram to strike or militants to cross over from Burkina Faso. So how many people can they kill? They attack a hotel, they kill 10, 15 people. But you are losing tens, if not hundreds of people every day as a result of bad public safety you know, mechanisms you have. And so I believe that that area, people are dying in hospitals. And the hospitals, look, medical negligence for you to lose a relative. I read a story on Ghana Web about a family that was suing one of the hospitals uh, because of what they perceive as medical negligence. Because they should have conducted surgery, they kept delaying, they had to give some money, they went for some scan, they said, hey, so you have money like that, <laughs> from 25,000, bring all the 40K. Yeah. That is a, sec a national security issue. If I don't feel safe when I have headache and I'm on admission, it should be a thing of consent to the police. BNI, or what is now called N NIB, should NIB. be consent. National Security Secretary should be consent. 
So I believe that it's not an issue of capacity. Look at the recruitments we are doing, Ni. The state security agencies are recruiting. GIS is recruiting. The Ghana Fire Service is recruiting. The Army recently recruited. We saw the long queue from LWOG through cantonments. So it's not an issue of capacity. It's a change of perception of what security means so that we will understand what our priorities should be as a country and then tackle them head on. And I believe, I, I think we've, we have emphasized too much on counterterrorism. We have, you know, imported America's number one security challenge and made it our own. If Al-Qaeda wants to attack America and so America takes counterterrorism serious, that doesn't mean that should be the go-to thing. For all nations in West Africa or the West rest of Africa, road accidents and kudos to Ghana Web on your road safety initiative. Road accidents have killed us over the years more than any other thing. Disease has killed us over the years more than any other thing. So I think we need a tweak of our understanding of national security. And I believe that the youth of soft power, outreach, engaging people, giving people the right orientation would go a long way. Uh, to make Ghana cling to its reputation as one of the most peaceful countries uh, in West Africa to attract the kind of foreign direct investment we want. I pray the IGP is listening and watching as well to take a cue from what you've said. Very great uh, submissions. We, we think that if you are strong, it means safe match, there is a parade we are <laughs> exhibiting. Security has long moved from yeah. that. Mm. We need to individualize security, come yeah. to the level of the people. Look, the cleaner who comes to work at dawn, how safe is the person? Yeah. It's a national security issue. Because somebody can compromise your cleaner and the person can have a bargain device. Yeah. Maybe you don't. Look, there are instances police officers complain to us when they are put on duty in the houses of ministers. They are so ill-treated. Where to even attend nature's call is difficult for them. And this is a guy who is only five seconds away from your life. He's armed, but he's not happy. You are a rich man. You have deficit of six months arrears. You've not paid your driver or your watchman. And beyond, apart from God, your life is in the hands of these people. So we need to completely do an overhaul of the way people see security. And we see ritual killings take place now. Yes, some are for money rituals. But how serious have we taken mental security in Ghana? Every corporate entity should every six months have a psychiatric specialist come and interview your employees. Because if the employee is not happy, the MD's life is at risk. Because he can just barge into a, uh, your office and then bludgeon you with a knife. And some of these issues are mental security issues. Security is really broad. It's broad. And, and I believe that the time has come for us to spread the tentacles of our security apparatuses so that we can tackle uh, some of these issues. Bribery and corruption on our roads. Policemen taking, I mean, pittance. Uh, we, we, we all see them and we are with them when this is done. Some of us give the money. Is it something that we should be worried about or is something that we should forget about? Major issues that we should deal Kidnapping with. Kidnapping syndicates have found fertile ground in Ghana. Because someone stops a Corolla, oh, I buy, I buy, you just give a token. Nobody searches what is back there in your trunk mm -hmm. or boot. And people just don't kidnap. When they kidnap, they move. I almost served a client as a consultant. He came from Russia. He was working into, in, in mining. Look, in Ghana, in Accra, he was stopped at a checkpoint and people had labels of Interpol. They were fake. <laughs> and they kidnapped him. Wow. And they moved him from one safe house to another, torturing him and forcing him to sign off on documents. And they sold off his property, a foreigner. For eight months, nobody knew his whereabouts. In this country? In this country. There are property owners all in the name of we are into real estate. People come in with bags of money. They rent apartments and houses, apartments and houses. Who checks the backgrounds of these people? Of course, the safe houses they were keeping the kidnappy in were rented places. For so long, we have made a recommendation there should be a common database between property owners and national security. 
It shouldn't be like I have money for two years. So as soon as I come, I pay the landlord or landlady. Then I move in. People don't know they are neighbors. And if Al-Qaeda wants to strike, the person may come for short stay. I was in Nairobi, the Westgate Mall, where we lost Professor Awono. Yeah. They said, incidentally, the guys had rented one of the shops. And gradually, they were moving the weapons. And when D-Day came, they struck. You are a landlady. Young men are living, living in your house. They're driving Porsche cars. They don't work during the day. They play music all day long. They go out, out at night and come at dawn. They are a threat to national security. So all of these things come together to make up the well-being and security of a country. And I believe that we need to look at these fine details. If not, Ghana will lose its reputation as a peaceful country. Thank you very much, Alaji Ebad Ibrahim. That was a very informative discussion. And this is the lowdown. My name is Nia Kwe Ismail Akwe. Watch us every Monday on Ghana Web TV. Be safe.